first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, give this lecture. Uh, in the past few the years, we've been engaging in the area of biofuels. I'm sure most of you are aware that uh, one of the most notable events in the past uh, few years, well, of course, other than the financial crisis in the last two weeks or so, energy crisis is probably the most uh, important uh, issues facing uh, the world. So a few years ago, the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy uh, set a goal roughly to replace 30% of gasoline by year 2030. And this kind of rough goal has been revised several times by the Congress, by the White House, and so on and so forth. But roughly, this is the ambitious goal. And it was embraced by many uh, uh, other countries and uh, researchers. Now, in order to deliver this, we have to somehow figure out a way to convert a renewable energy source, which is uh, solar energy, to something that we can pump into the current day vehicle. Okay. That means we have to use the liquid fuel. In order to do that, the current concept is first we use the uh, solar energy to grow biomass. And then somehow we convert biomass to a fermentable substrate. And then the, the fermentation to produce a liquid fuel. In order to uh, replace 30% of gasoline by 2030, we will have to produce 60 billion gallons per year, roughly speaking. In order to produce that much of uh, liquid fuel, we need 750 million tons of biomass, or roughly 1 billion tons of biomass. That's what is known as the billion ton biomass uh, problem. In order to produce that much of the biomass, we need about 75 million acres of land. For people who live in uh, Hong Kong, it's probably too hard to imagine what is 75 million acres of land. But it is 75% 70, of California. So it's not a small amount of land. So that means there are a lot of uh, technical issues, uh, both technical and scientific issues need to be solved. How do you get water? How do you reduce fertilizer use, pesticides, and so on and so forth? How do you deconstruct biomass to sugar? How do you ferment sugar to uh, a good biofuel? So we focus on the, uh, the uh, last end of the problem. How do we get a good biofuel? We know that ethanol is the front runner of biofuel. It has a lot of good properties to have been the first success uh, biofuel in the world but it is less than ideal. We think uh, that uh, longer chain alcohols actually is a better uh, uh, fuel. Of course, nothing is ideal. It, you, you gain something, you lose something. Okay, in our mind, C4, C5 alcohols has several advantages. For example, it has uh, energy content almost the same as gasoline, as opposed to ethanol, which is about two thirds of the energy content in gasoline. Also, Ethanol has a property to attract water from the atmosphere. This is called hygroscopicity, and therefore it's corrosive. Once it's corrosive, it cannot directly pump into a current day vehicle. You have to retrofit the vehicle, even though it's not very expensive. And because of this hygroscopicity, you cannot pump it using the current day pipelines. So you have to use trucks or trains to ship from Iowa to either coast, um, New York, or Los Angeles. That increases the cost dramatically. And no one will be interested in uh, um, putting out a large capital today to ship ethanol uh, uh, across the continent. Now, if you use a C4, C5 alcohols, this kind of problem can be avoided. Okay. It's not hydroscopic. It has a very high uh, hydrophobicity. It doesn't like water. And therefore, you can mix in any ratio to the current day vehicle. You can use completely um, high alcohol, or you can mix with, uh, with uh, gasoline. Now, one last property that uh, is not very obvious is vapor pressure. Ethanol actually has a very high vapor pressure, and C4 or C5 alcohols has a low vapor pressure. So now, why is that vapor pressure important? It turns out that vapor pressure dramatically changed the uh, uh, total vapor pressure of the mixture. If you mix ethanol with gasoline, for example, it brings up the vapor pressure of both because it's a non-ideal uh, mixture of behavior. If you mix C4, C5 alcohols with gasoline, it brings down the vapor pressure. Now, if vapor pressure is too high, you exceed the gasoline spec, and you will not be able to sell that in 
Southern, uh, Cali in Southern California or the Southern state, United States, you will have to remove some of the lighter components in gasoline in order to use uh, lighter uh, e ethanol. Now, the estimation shows that if you remove lighter components, that will increase the cost by $1 per gallon, which is dramatic. So for that reason, vapor pressure is a very important attribute, even though it's not as obvious. Now, of course, nothing is perfect. Ethanol has a very uh, important advantage over C4, C5 alcohol. That is, it has very high production yield. It has been used for many, many thousands of year, year, years uh, in human uh, fermentation. C4, C5 alcohol is just uh, is a very low the production yield when we started to work on this. Now, what kind of higher alcohols will be interested in? We're interested in starting from C3 to C4 and C5. And now we're interested in even higher. But let's look at the C3, C4, C5. When you have more than two carbons, you begin to have branching pattern. You have isopropanol, n-propanol, n-burinol, isopropanol, and two methyl, one burinol, and so on and so forth. You begin to have this branching pattern. Among these alcohols, only two of them have been naturally produced by uh, native organisms. One is isopropanol, one is n -burinol. These are produced from Clostridium. All others have not been produced naturally in high quantities using native organisms. At best, it's identified as a trace amount of uh, products in fermentation. So when we started looking at this, of course, we first look at how we can learn from nature. Nature has given us empyrinol. Okay, empyrinol was synthesized by Clostridium. This Clostridium was uh, 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 first identified by Charles Wiseman uh, in England uh, in the, about 1910 or so. And this was identified as the first uh, organism that produced an industrially important uh, solvent. Charles Wiseman, by the way, later became the, president, the first president of Israel. So around the time of First World War, this uh, Weizmann process was the uh, main process to make a synthetic rubber. And then between the two uh, world wars, DuPont actually made a lot of uh, burinol uh, for various applications. After the Second World War, the petroleum price and the, the advance of petroleum processing uh, become so cheap that it replaces the uh, fermentation processes, uh, for the uh, clostridium-based embryonal uh, production become uncompetitive. So if you look at the uh, history of embryonal fermentation, you find that after about 100 years of uh, optimization, the best that uh, uh, we can get in the whole field is a little less than 20 grams per liter. And with a yield of about 30, about 83% uh, um, of theoretical maximum. So this is the two numbers I'd like you to remember for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Less than 20 gram per liter, and about 80 gram, 80 percent of theoretical maximum. So if we were to develop an organism, these are the benchmark numbers that we have to compare with. So as a uh, metabolic engineer and synthetic biologist, uh, we, of course, want to do something different from nature. So the first thing we thought about is E. coli. Why E. coli? Well, I don't have to convince you that E. coli has several advantages. It grows very fast, doubles every uh, 30 minutes or so. It's easy to manipulate. We can change E. coli to do many exciting things, as we heard in this meeting and previous meetings. Because we can manipulate everything, therefore it has a high potential for homofermentative production. So we don't have to deal with the byproducts that hopefully increase the yield. And also one last importance is that it is the oxygen indifferent. And that turns out to be very beneficial, at least for graduate students. You don't have to work in an aerobic chamber all the time and increase the speed of development quite a bit. It also has some cons. For example, uh, E. coli never seen Burino before, so it's probably not very tolerant to Burino. It turns out that it's not so bad. Okay? The native Clostridium can resist to Burino about 1.3%, whereas E. coli can go up to about 1%. So there's some differences, but not that much. And 
the question remains as, is it possible to produce these higher alcohols in E. coli? And not just produce a small amount, produce them efficiently. Okay, produce these kinds of, of, of alcohols in a small amount is not a big challenge. Produce them efficiently, that's a big challenge. And that's what we need for biofuels application. So we started out working with uh, this kind of problem. We use something that's relatively simple to work with. That is a smaller uh, um, uh, compound, isopropanol. Isopropanol turns out to be only three more steps away from a native E. coli met metabolism. Uh, e. coli can produce acetyl-CoA through various processes. Uh, it's at the end of the glycolysis, the beginning of the TCA cycle. All you have to do is now stick three enzymes from various sources and hopefully you can produce isopropanol, isopropanol from acetyl-CoA. So we did just that. And sure enough, almost the first few tries, we got it to work. We can quickly produce uh, more than two grams per liter of isopropanol, C3 compounds. And a little bit of optimization showed that we can produce five grams per liter with a prolonged uh, fermentation. Uh, keep in mind, everything we did is in bench, uh, bench scale flask. This is not even optimized in fermenters, so there's still a long way uh, a large room to improve. Nevertheless, this gives a proof of principle that yes, we can easily manipulate this kind of, uh, of uh, intermediate metabolism to produce the fuels of our interest and in E. coli. So we move down to a little bit more challenging problem that is to produce n furanol from E. coli. So we first uh, clone all these enzymes from Clostridium, trying to move them into E. coli and that involves uh, several different enzymes. It turns out that the second example here is a little bit more difficult. We have to do a lot of optimization, um, check the enzyme activity to make sure that enzymes are properly expressed, change various promoters, various expression levels, copy numbers, and even gene order, orders, and so on and so forth. And finally, we got a little tiny peak in GC mass back identified as n -bunal. So that was, to our knowledge, the first peak from, uh, from E. coli. <laughs> and we did a little bit more optimization by knocking out the host uh, uh, chromosome uh, to avoid competing uh, pathways. And by doing that, we were able to increase the production to about uh, th uh, 300, mini uh, 300 uh, milligram per liter very small amount compared to what we need, but it was encouraging. So then we keep optimizing, and for some reason, we could not break the above uh, around the half gram per liter. The rough, roughly, we stopped there. At that time, we have two choices. We can continue to optimize this process. Okay, I'm sure sooner or later we're gonna get it to work, or we can think of uh, another strategy. We ask ourselves the question, why does this clostridium n pathway doesn't work so well in E. coli, whereas the isopropanol pathway works pretty well? Is there any other way we can use to make this similar compound? So we went back to the drawing board. It turns out that most organisms use this kind of chemistry to make alcohols. They take a keto acid pyruvate, first uh, go through an oxidative decarboxylation, makes acetyl-CoA, and then two steps of reduction goes to an alcohol. This is the same chemistry used in human beings, in E. coli, in most other organisms. Now nature has extended this pathway to higher alcohols to make antheronol, and only Clostridium has this pathway. To my knowledge, to my imagination, if you will, Clostridium evolved this pathway not to produce ambulinol. It's actually to avoid toxicity of acetate, which is the immediate challenge of low pH. So convert acetate to ambulinol, it can gain some more time to survive. So use practically the same type of chemistry to, uh, uh, use, uh, to produce ambulinol. You can see it involves a lot of steps. On the other hand, there is another type of chemistry that nature evolved to make ethanol that is direct non-oxidative decarboxylation uh, decarbo from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. 
And is Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Zymomonas use this pathway to make ethanol? Now, for those of you who are familiar with ethanol fermentation, you know these are exactly the two organisms that produce lots of ethanol. E. coli and all other uh, organisms produce ethanol, but not very efficiently. So immediate hunch to everyone is that this is the most efficient pathway. It is the more efficient pathway compared to this torturous uh, CoA dependent pathway. The question now is, can we extend this pathway to produce higher chain alcohols? Okay. Nature has not done that, but we as engineers, can we engineer something so that this has become possible? So it turns out that it is possible if you understand chemistry a little bit better, pyruvate is a keto acid. The first non oxidative decarboxylation get rid of the CO2, then become an aldehyde, then uh, a reduction, it goes to ethanol. Now pyruvate is one of the uh, smallest keto acids. If you can stick a big R group at the end of pyruvate, for those of you who are not a uh, chemistry major, let me just tell you, this R group represents several different kind of uh, uh, carbon skeleton. So if you have a higher chain, the alcohol, this uh, R chain is longer and longer. The same kind of chemistry can happen if, if you find a proper enzyme that can conduct the same kind of chemistry. It turns out that this kind of chemistry has been proposed 100 years ago. This is called the er Ehrlich, I can't pronounce it in uh, German, the Ehrlich pathway is, put, is uh, identified about 100 years ago as a way to degrade amino acid. So one can imagine that there must be some enzyme that exists in nature that can degrade this kind of keto acids to higher alcohols. Fortunately, all these enzymes have been well studied and crystallized. Now, if you further look at the active sites of the crystal structure, you see that Zymomonas mobilis, which is a very good ethanol producer that decarboxylates pyruvate, the small substrate. It has a very small active center. This is not the active, this is the uh, cofactor, this is not pyruvate. The pyruvate actually stick into between. So it's very small, and therefore it doesn't take a larger substrate. It cannot produce a larger alcohol. That's why it's so good to make specifically ethanol. Now, if you find an enzyme or enlarge this uh, active site so that it can take a larger substrate, potentially you can use this to catalyze the same reaction and produce longer chain alcohols. And that's, if that's possible, then all of a sudden you can expand the horizon dramatically. Instead of taking what nature gives you, you now can use various kinds of keto acids to produce various kinds of alcohols. And most of them, in fact, all of them have fuel properties that are favorable. So the first thing we did is clone these enzymes and then try to identify is there any corresponding peaks that we can identify from GC mass spec. Indeed, it, it's there all the time. Okay. We can identify all these different alcohols in the fermentation uh, yield, in the fermentation uh, products, as long as we clone these enzymes in there. We then do a little bit uh, further characterization, trying to feed the corresponding keto acids. And sure enough, every time we feed the corresponding keto acids, we get the corresponding increase in the alcohols that we are interested in, indicating that this kind of chemistry is exactly what's going on, converting the keto acids to the corresponding alcohols that we're interested in. Okay, so the chemistry works, and works in E. coli. Now, the challenge is, is then becoming, how do we supply these kind of keto acids to E. coli? We can actually convert glucose to various kinds of these keto acids. These keto acids are conveniently located in the biosynthetic pathways of many amino acid pathways. For example, 2 keto isovalerate is an intermediate in valine biosynthesis. Okay. 2 keto 4 metal, you don't have to know these names, it's kind of a mouthful. 2 keto 4 metal pentanoate. Okay. It's a precursor in leucine biosynthesis. So there are many, many kind of these kind of uh, these keto acids that you can steal, if you will, steal away from amino acid pathway and shoot it down to the uh, alcohol pathway to make biofuels for yourself. So we focus first on this uh, isobutanol production. 
So if you look at this in detail, you see that pyruvate, as I said earlier, is the smallest keto acid. Two steps, you can produce ethanol. The theoretical yield can reach about 51%, okay, gram per gram. One gram of sugar, you can make 51 grams, I'm sorry, one gram of sugar make 0.51 grams of ethanol. Isopurinol, all you have to do is shoot it down three more steps and then conduct the same reaction again, you then obtain isopurinol. The theoretical yield is a little bit lower if you compare with weight by weight, okay, you can get to uh, 0.41 grams, so 41 grams per 100 grams of glucose. So it's lower than, than ethanol. But if you consider the energy yield, because isopurinol has a higher energy content, ethanol has a lower energy content. If you adjust the difference, then this uh, 0.51 gram of uh, ethanol is equivalent to 0.3 grams of gasoline, whereas this 0.41 grams of uh, isopurinol is equivalent to 0.37 grams of gasoline. So now you gain uh, the advantage. Even though you lose the mass uh, uh, efficiency, you gain the energy efficiency. And that energy is one of the important things for biofuel. So how do we do this? We convert uh, pyruvate to a uh, valine pathway. We shoot this to valine pathway and steal the uh, intermediates to the alcohol fermentation pathway. Okay, then we get to isopurinol. So all we have to do is clone this enzyme, of course, clone that properly, and almost the first few tries, we get to break one gram per liter bar. We actually get 2.2 gram per liter in one of the first tries. So that indicates that this system works, and not just works, it works very well. Okay. Compared to the embryonal pathway that we try to move from Clostridium to E. coli, that we try, try so many times, we couldn't even break one gram per liter uh, level. Now, easily, we break one gram per liter. We are in two gram per liter range already. Then we can do a little bit more optimization. And then we found out that there is another bottleneck that is in the front end of this pathway. This enzyme, this first step, characterized by several different enzymes that has this kind of activity. And most of these enzymes have dual activity. It can take the regular substrate pyruvate, or you can take a longer substrate, which is two kilo butyrate. Okay. Because of that, it loses efficiency. So if we can narrow down this uh, uh, substrate uh, range, we'll be able to increase the efficiency. And okay. now this time, we have an opposite challenge. We don't want this enzyme to be too promiscuous, so it takes only pyruvate. We don't want, we don't want it to take a larger substrate. So we have to find an enzyme that has a smaller uh, active site uh, cavity. And this enzyme from, uh, from uh, Bacillus happened to be useful for us. So after changing to this enzyme, very quickly, we're able to increase by five-fold. We now break 10 gram per liter range. We can make the uh, isopurinol at about 12, 13, 15 gram per liter range very easily. After that, all we have to do is optimize the system by knocking out various genes in competing pathways, and now we can achieve 22 gram per liter. Okay, remember, the, the benchmark that I asked you to remember is 20 gram per liter and about 80% of the theoretical maximum. Now, we exceeded this uh, tighter target. We achieved 22 gram per liter of uh, isopurinol production, and the yield is about 83% of the theoretical maximum. And keep in mind, this is all in fermenter, not, uh, in shake flask only. So if you want to do it in a fermenter, there's still large room to improve. So usually you can improve at least three, four fold above what you have done in shake flask in the regular um, uh, bioreactor. So we have done isoburinol. We can do the same for other the kind of uh, alcohols. Okay, three metal, one burinol. Okay, so all we have to do is uh, shoot down this pathway a few more steps. The chain elongation step get to one more chain to five carbons. This time we get to three metal, one burinol. Okay, we we'll accomplish that. We'll show you data later. Or we can take a completely different pathway. Okay, take the other side of the pathway from threonine to keto butyrate and then shoot down to propanol. Or we can do something else to go to two metal, one burinol. 
Okay, this is a three-name pathway, it's very long, but you can go to one propanol. You can also uh, use this pathway. Uh, before you go to propanol, you do another chain elongation, you go to uh, two metal, one furanol. You can play this variations almost at will. Okay, this slide shows that we have uh, constructed various uh, organisms, produce various kinds of, uh, of alcohol, the two metal furanol, isopurinol, propanol, so on and so forth. Now, before we go into this project, we wanted to produce n -pyrinol. Okay, Now, how do we use this kind of strategy to produce n -pyrinol? n -pyrinol, if you want to use a keto acid pathway, you have to find something that uh, corresponds, some uh, keto acids that correspond to this structure. It turns out that this intermediate is not present in E. coli. Okay. However, you can find something similar. And a similar structure is keto isocaparate. This is the intermediate in the, bio, in the biosynthesis of leucine. The difference between this compound and this is this metal group, a small tiny metal group shown here. Okay. So leucine biosynthesis starts from two keto isovalerate. So we perhaps can steal this kind of pathway and hopefully it can use a smaller substrate. Now we're playing this game. Sometimes we feed larger substrates, sometimes we use smaller substrate. We hope to steer the same kind of chemistry to produce uh, different kind of, uh, of uh, structures. If we can use this, we can produce m -pyrinol. So we can use many kinds of uh, strategies to produce various kinds of uh, uh, higher, higher chain alcohols. Now, since my time is coming up, uh, so I'm going to um, summarize very quickly. Now, isopyrinol has not been tested as a fuel. m -pyrinol has been tested several times, but isopyrinol has not. Now we produce isopyrinol so well, does it actually work as a fuel? Well, it does. Isopyrinol and m -pyrinol has very similar physical chemical properties. So they have the same kind of energy content, the same kind of hydrophobicity, and so on and so forth. On top of that, isopyrinol, because of the branching pattern, it has a higher octane number. Okay. What is octane number? For those of you who are not familiar with this, the higher the octane number, the easier it burns in the internal combustion engine, and therefore it sells at a higher price. Okay. You have to pay a premium for this. Ethanol is uh, very good in that respect. But if you use pyrinol, you win on every aspect, but octane number you lose. Now if you use isopyrinol, you combine the best of the both worlds. Okay, you can uh, capture the properties, the good property of m -pyrinol, and also enjoy the, the, the high octane number. Okay, the company that uh, licensed our technology actually tests this in a real engine, the Chevy engine, in various kind of RPM by mixing isopyrinol in various com composition with gasoline. In every mixture, you see that isopyrinol mixture perform either the same or better than gasoline. If you look at the vapor pressure, as I mentioned earlier, vapor pressure is very, very important for biofuel. It actually brings down the vapor pressure of the mixture, allowing the gasoline manufacturer to mix in the less expensive but lighter components, and therefore uh, drive down the cost dramatically. And then the octane number, as I, I, I mentioned, actually exceeds 100. Okay, so that's a good news for uh, fuel application. And then if you actually measure the uh, miles per gallon, okay, you can see if you mix at about 20% isopyrinol with gasoline, it actually increase the miles per gallon by about 5%, even though the energy content is lower. Okay, this is the energy content actually lower. This is BTU per gallon. Energy content is actually lower, but miles per gallon actually increase, presumably because it burns more efficiently. So what's new in this strategy? Let me summarize this. It harnesses the cell's most natural pathway and therefore it's non-toxic pathway for production of fuels. Because of that, it opens the possibility for many fuel grade the C4, C5 alcohol production. And, and because of this efficiency, this is a, a, a non-toxicity, it can be very high efficient production and it's easily transferable to any other organism because all organisms have biosynthetic pathway for, for uh, uh, amino acids. So you don't have to work too much to get to this point. Because of that, then you can think about how to fuel uh, uh, organisms that directly convert cellulose to fuel or even from CO2 to fuel using a similar kind of strategy. 
finally, it allows evolutionary strategy because all these are amino acid based. So it, it's tightly re related to uh, cell growth. I do have a few slides to talk about that, but I'm running out of uh, time, so I'm going to skip that. These are the slides talking about evolution. I'm going to skip. <laughs> finally, the take home message. Okay, we think that uh, high chain alcohols potentially can be our next generation uh, biofuel because of the high energy density compatible with current infrastructure. You don't use, you don't have to change your vehicle. You don't have to use a new pipeline to ship it. It gives you better air quality. Um, it has more efficient production process. Finally, because it is uh, more hydrophobic and therefore you use less water in the whole production process. Okay, this was an added benefit as we know that water become an issue these days. Finally, I'd like to thank my very capable grad students and postdocs uh, who are working in uh, biofuel. Shota Azumi is one of the main postdocs working in this. All others are uh, uh, grad students are still working on the title. The Hanai was a, a visiting professor from Japan. I'd also, also like to thank my other members of, of my uh, lab who are working on related projects, but not directly on biofuels. And I'd like to thank the um, financial support from NIH, DOE, NSF, and the uh, company who licensed our technology, GIVO. Thank you. Yes, actually the, the cell will not grow beyond 1%, 0.5%, but as you see our data, the cells are not growing but keep producing. So that's a good news. We're not completely dependent. It's not growing, it's dead, but it's still producing. It's good news. Okay, yeah, we have from there, yes. Yes, please. You said it's easily transferable to other organisms. Have you tried? Uh, my my stint is easy. When I say easy, no one will agree with me, of course. Right? <laughs> Conceptually easy. Let me clarify that. Conceptually easy transfer to other organisms. Huh. Okay? We, we did try. Yeah, we have a few success uh, in the pipeline with report very short, very short. Okay. And have you, what's involved in the separation? So uh, separation you... actually is pretty simple. Okay. Uh, first of all, you don't use the distillation. So some people uh, look at that distillation, or well, it doesn't make any sense that you could use uh, high energy to do that. Uh, there are many different ways that people publish to, produce, to separate the ambulance, uh involving preparation, the membrane process, and many different things you can use. And the same thing can be applied to uh, isoburnal. Yes. Yeah. Um, you started off by talking about the massive acreage that would be necessary for, for realizing the billion ton vision. Um, and then said, you know, you're not looking at that side of it. Does working with butanol or embutanol reduce that acreage? Does it? And you also mentioned at the end that this has lower water use. You're not referring to the water use to grow the cellulose. You're talking about in the final part. Uh, no, the, the second uh, question first. That we're talking about only the production phase that use less water. Yeah. Uh, the first part. How does it impact the, the land use? Well, we have a more efficient process. Number two, eventually we are going to. Uh, it's a, um, so, for example, we're going to do a, a process that directly converts the uh, cellulose to, to isoprenol or CO2 to isoprenol, then uh, we can impact uh, that way. In, in short, if you improve the efficiency every, uh, every step in the link, you're going to improve the uh, land usage that way. Just to be clear, cellulose still requires land. I agree. <laughs> Okay, well, unfortunately, we'll have to, that'll have to be the last question. So thank you.